Welcome back to the Self-Esteem and Confidence Mindset Podcast with me, Johnny Pardo. Today, I have a special guest on the episode with me, Sharon, where we're going to be talking about self-confidence, grief, personal growth, and much, much more. So welcome to the show, Sharon. Johnny, thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored to be here. It's really cool. I'm excited. I'm excited as well. And I know you've got a lot of important messages that we, we want to get across today and uh, help a lot of people. So thank you for all the work you're doing. So I'll give a quick introduction into Sharon, and then we'll go into her story and into the conversation today. So Sharon and her sister Erica are the proud owners of their own weekly podcast, Healing Starts With The Heart, which is on multiple platforms. We can say a bit more about that at the end. She's also a certified grief specialist and certified life coach. And Sharon and Erica manage their own venture teaching educational classes about grief. So Sharon, tell us a little bit about, and I know we've spoken, but tell us a little bit about what maybe some highlights from your story and what actually got you into this area of grief. Yes, absolutely. So I was a real estate agent. And I was sitting in a real estate open house and my daughter called me. It was Father's Day weekend. All of my family was on a trip at the lake for the summer. And they, she was screaming into the phone that she'd lost my nephew. Three hours after that initial phone call, we found out that my nephew Austin had drowned right there by the lake from carbon monoxide poisoning. And honestly, Johnny, the first thing that went through my mind was that I didn't know how to do this. I didn't know how to grieve. I didn't know how the first step. And so I set out on a mission to find out everything that I could to help my sister through the process. And it was um, three hours after that call, we found out that he had drowned and I just started working every day, just pulling up everything I could. And everything I was finding was absolute junk. It was basically just wait, You'll heal in time. You'll feel better in time. And I couldn't believe that that was the only thing there. I just want to finish my story and let you know that 10 years after that, that initial experience, her 21-year-old son was killed in a motorcycle accident. And so for the second time, I had to tell her that she had lost another child. But through both experiences, I walked very closely with her and we created a program that absolutely helps people heal from the brokenness due to grief and loss hmm. well thank you for sharing that and you know i'm glad you're able to touch people's lives and help them through the process now uh from your own strengths and your own research into that so can i ask what what does grief mean to you because obviously we were speaking about it it could be loss of a loved one uh but it could also mean other things so i just wanted to kind of get your your take on that so to me, grief is the process that your heart goes through. It's absolutely what your heart goes through after a loss of any kind. But the thing that I was so astonished to find out is that grief is not just death, just we in society attach it to death all the time. But think about this. Mm. You could grieve from losing a job. You could grieve from losing a pet. You could grieve just because your life is not happy or fulfilling. It could send you into a grieving experience. You could grieve from moving and leaving all your friends and family behind. There are over 45 or more known losses that we know can cause a grieving experience in your heart. Most people you meet, Johnny, are grieving or have grieved or have had grieving experiences, but they just don't, they haven't attached the word grief to it because someone hasn't died. Mm, that's, that's really interesting perspective. Yeah. I think everyone would have gone through some kind of grief in that sense. Uh, although most of us will, will sadly lose someone we in our family at some point, but there are these other forms as well. Um, yeah, a really, really interesting perspective. Was that something you you discovered from your own life, or was it as you were kind of reading more into the subject? It was absolutely that I discovered from Austin's dying because I never, who would have thought grief? I wouldn't have attached grief to it. Like one of my early grieving experiences was 
uh, breaking up with my first love in high school. You know, we all have that experience of breaking up with the first love and how deeply it hurts. But I wouldn't have attached the word grief to that. I just called it a breakup. And then after Austin died and I started to do research on it, I realized that what actually happened with my heart was an absolute grieving experience that my heart went through because of the breakup. Mm. And how, how important, because a lot of us, we live in this busy society and a, a lot, I don't want to say, uh, probably stereotyping slightly, us men tend to have this, this, this kind of like, okay, all right, that's happened, whether it's a death or something, and it's like, right, get on with it. Uh, you yeah. know, we tell, usually say it to ourselves, or not just guys, but women can do that as well. But how, how important is it to connect with yourself in, in any kind of grieving process? It is 100% one of the most important things we need to do. So think about this. Let's go back to when little Bobby was a little boy, right? He's mm. two years old. Grandpa comes over. He falls down. He starts to cry. What does grandpa tell him? You stop that crying. Are you a big boy or are you a baby? And quickly, Bobby figures out, I can't show any signs of emotions. Otherwise, I'm going to get scolded for it. So as Bobby starts to grow up in his life, every time something hurts him or is bothered by him, he's either told by society, he's told by family and friends, big boys don't cry, big boys don't cry. And so what do we do with all of this pain? It just sits there. It's almost like we have to swallow it down. We keep swallowing it down. We're not allowed to show it. We're not allowed to work through it. On top of the fact that we're not even given the book on how to work through this pain, mm -hmm. how to go through this, there's an exact science on how to work through the brokenness in our heart. And I, I love that you asked that question because just the other day, I was watching a video where they at, went around on the street and they asked young men, who do you talk to when you're upset? Who do you talk to when you're sad? Who do you talk to when you're broken? And every single one of them, they just randomly walked into these young men and they're like, nobody, you're not allowed to talk to about that. Nobody's gonna listen. Nobody's gonna hear you. I, it broke my heart to see all these young guys just thinking when stuff happens, I just gotta push it down. I gotta be a man, big boys don't cry. And the truth is emotional pain hurts and it hurts in the heart and it sticks there. If you don't get rid of it, it will follow you. It will follow you around. Hmm. Yeah, no. Int interesting perspective asking and they all came up with the answer wow yeah yeah and i I've, I've been i'm put my hands i've been guilty of that a lot in the past yeah just be, <laughs> you know it got me you know it can get get you it can affect your self-esteem in a way because it's you, you don't have that relationship with yourself that you want and you're not acknowledging how you really feel like really feeling so you're losing yeah. that connection with yourself so therefore you're neglecting yourself and yeah i think that's a really important point uh that you're bringing home on on that one of it's it's quite <laughs> quite a few people do that in terms of uh, yeah bottling, a lot bottling it. yeah bottling it so are there like for someone who's perhaps been bottling grief away again and again and again but they're kind of at this point of like right, I need to sort of work through this stuff and release it a little bit more. Are there any kind of ways you, you would perhaps suggest for them to start or where they can starting points to start releasing some of this? Absolutely. 100% to, is to acknowledge that your heart is broken or acknowledge that you have some pain or acknowledge that you have some residual pain that's there. That's number one is acknowledge there's something going on here. The number one thing that grievers need to do is to talk. They need to talk and they're, they're absolutely, or most of them are dying to talk and tell the story. Let's just talk about this. Let me just talk about what this breakup is about. What she said, she doesn't want to date me anymore and how that makes me feel. But unfortunately, grievers need to talk, but as importantly as they need to talk, they need to be listened to and heard with respect. So mm. it's also not about me trying to fix you. It's just about me listening. So I would say find someone that you feel comfortable with and that you trust and just talk, just talk it out. When you hear yourself say it out loud, that's the first step, which is so cool. The another way is you could start journaling it. If you don't have someone safe, you could really journal it a lot. You could write it out. You could sit down and write out the um, what you're feeling daily. 
The other thing that I would say, if you're advanced enough and you could really grasp onto the emotions that you're feeling is to lean into the emotions. So for example, if I woke up today and I felt really sad, I would just acknowledge that I'm, I'm having sadness and try to see what that sadness is attached to. Man, this is really about my friend and just kind of lean into it and go with it instead of resisting it. We want to push back and resist it because it's not comfortable. Mm. Yeah, I love that. I love what you said. One thing I really like what you said there because I'm, I'm very keen on when we're talking about self-confidence uh, and self-esteem is try to like role model and be around people to make you feel good and, and those kind of things. And sometimes what, what you really said about someone who's actually going to listen, sometimes people actually do have good intention and they're not bad people at all, but they've got their own agenda and they're, they're going to project yeah. everything onto you. So yeah, I like what you said about making, making sure. I remember like when I did me personally, from an example, when I went through quite like a, a uh, tough breakup with a girl uh, I was talking to a friend for example he was he was just like I'm here to listen mate but uh, I kind of <laughs> no he's just going to project all his own stuff onto me and it was just like I felt worse talking to it so it is about picking the right person so I do really like to emphasize that point it has to be someone that you trust otherwise you're not going to go there deep enough right to really go there so I had a friend call me the other day it was a a young male friend who actually did have a breakup of, the, of a relationship. And everybody keeps, the advice he keeps getting is, there's plenty of fish in the sea. You'll find somebody else. And he's like, I know I can find somebody else. But the point is, I feel really sad about this. And I mean, he was doing the ugly cry over the phone. I could tell just tears and snot. And I just listened and I said, I was sorry. And what could I offer to help or what I could do? A lot of times what our friends will do when we start to go into that really intimate conversation is they'll change the subject. Oh yeah, you know, oh no, I know your heart's breaking, but did you see the Dodger game last week? Or did you see that football game? They change the subject. They don't mean to do that. The second thing they do is they will give unsolicited advice of an emotion of an intellectual nature right? Designed to go to our brain instead of going to our heart. So something like this. Oh man, there's plenty of fish in the sea. You'll get somebody else. You just give it time. And I know you'll start to feel better as opposed to something like this. I can't imagine how bad that must feel for you. I'm so glad I'm here to listen to you. That's it. Mm. There are no words we can give them to fix it. Your heart's broken. There are no words. What am I going to tell you? You're, if your spouse just dies and you called me up, what is one thing that I could say to make you feel better? Not one thing, but I can be a great heart with ears and just listen. Mm. Yeah, the power of the power of listening and just not try to find the solution instantly. Yeah, that's yeah. a really, really yeah powerful advice there. Finding that right person as well. Um, so yeah, um, like the other steps we talked about in terms of journaling and then uh, potentially, and then perhaps even feeling into emotions rather than resisting them as well, which was a, a good point in terms of, and I'm, I'm thinking I'm talking more to the achievers here being in that boat. Uh, but yeah, like there's a lot of, you know, us who are very determined to keep up our like daily rituals and everything we're doing, We've got to achieve all these goals and things like that when we're going through a grieving process. Would you generally say to like, or, or see Pete, it works better for people when they step back and perhaps just do the basics or the smaller things? It's kind of habits. Do people tend to scale back their habits a little bit when they're grieving? So self-care is so important, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I find a lot of times with really deep, deep grievers is even just getting in the bath or the shower is mm -hmm. like not interesting at all. But I would say definitely listen to your body, listen to your heart and listen to your soul and spirit, right? If today is just not going to happen and I need to stay in bed all day, then you need to stay in bed all day if that's your plan. And that's what you're going to do to revitalize yourself. The one thing you don't want to do is let one day become two days, become three days, become four months, right? So um, yes, but if you can stick to the routine and do the grieving, that's 100% what I, I aspire to. Because here's the deal. 
It's called grieving and living. It's not called grieving. You just go away somewhere to grieve. We have to grieve and live, which means I'm going to be with this broken heart, but I still got to go to the grocery store. I still got to do the grocery shopping. I still have to feed my family, Mm -hmm. but I still need to take the time aside to do the grieving part. I think what surprisingly happens to a lot of people, they don't realize that the grieving doesn't last 24 seven, right? The grieving comes in and it'll take a period and we can process that part of the pain, be with it, feel it, acknowledge it. And then we could go back to our daily chores. So yes, I think you can do both. Hmm. Yeah, no, it's good. And yeah, I, I sometimes, and I know people I've worked with have to scale back their habits sometimes, just make it easier, whether it's that like two hour gym workout becomes a 20 minute walk or something like that, you know, yeah. that's or run, you know, that's still going to be good. And maybe there is the odd day they can't do it, but yeah, it's just making those small little um, things. I like what you said about making time as well. Uh, yeah. The emotional gym as well as the physical gym is really important to, to visit. So yeah. It's oh, good absolutely. Thing. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And I hear you loud and clear. Yeah. It, what happens when the day is the grief is so bad and you can't you're the thought of going to the gym is just like not even on the list. The 20 minute walk might actually do you some good, you know. So we have a lot of uh, grievers that uh, will be talking to them like, well, I couldn't get out of bed. OK, then that's what you had to do to that day. That's what you needed for your self-care. So we don't try not to knock people too much because. Every day is going to be different until you are back on your full journey. Mm. Yeah, totally. I want to. I want to kind of touch on something a bit different now. In uh, something I've been like learning about a lot, in when it can actually be caught in the body a little bit, like when you've got grief in a certain body, whether that comes in different forms, like tightness in the shoulders or jaws and things like that. Um, is is that something you've experienced working with people that perhaps they've got? symptoms showing up physically or kind of tightness that shows up from maybe not processing the the grieving a hundred percent i'm so glad you asked this question i love this question grief is going to find a way out grief is going to find a way out you can swallow it down as much as you want to so typically what happens is i have i come upon a grieving experience i'm thinking about my loved one or my person right i'm thinking Mm -hmm. about my person I start to feel very emotional. It starts to come up. I can feel it, but I swallow it down. And every time it starts to try to come out the front of my face in the form of tears or snot or the ugly cry, I keep swallowing it down. It is going to come out. It cannot not come out. It'll come out in illness. It'll come out in pain. It'll come out in joint pain. It'll come out in hives. We've actually had people go to the hospital thinking they were having a heart attack and they were actually having a broken heart. You will see people with uh, IBS, cancer, all types of illnesses coming out. Grief is not just going to sit there. It has to come out. The most common way that we get it out in the short term is by crying, right? So the tears, um, are release of the energy. It's a release of the energy that comes across the front of our face. It's absolutely okay. But sometimes the tears don't come. So what do we do then if the tears aren't there? You can literally just sit in the pain and acknowledge that that you're having that pain. I can sit in the sadness. We know for a fact that most negative emotions, if we just sat in them, will pass through the body in about a minute and a half. But what we do is we feel sadness and right away we go to the kitchen and do the dishes. I feel loneliness and then I go find something else to do. So we find a lot of ways to avoid feeling the emotions. Do the feeling of the emotions, feel the pain as much as you can. That's the only way out of this is through the pain. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you touched on uh, crying. Uh, It it certainly can make you feel better in a way. It's it's always enjoyable. It's always it's an enjoyable release, soul cleansing, as they say sometimes. Um, But yeah, like, are there are there any ways like you've used to help help with crying I, I know you said obviously if you just sit with it sometimes the tears yeah. don't come but I don't know for me and I know some people there's certain musics that can kind of help help it come up a little bit as well so one of the things that I did after Austin died is that I would just pull up pictures of my phone of Austin 
Mm. And I would just look at the pictures and I actually help my clients with that. I say, why are you avoiding the pictures? They were like, I can't look at the pictures. It brings up the emotion. Good. That's what I want. So we will play music. I play songs. I play familiar songs. I would look at the music now. And most of this honestly is done in private and we call it processing the pain of grief. This is how we process the pain of grief out of our body. I just look at the photos and just go through them and just let the ugly cry come. Uh, sometimes clients will tell me, like I said, that the tears don't come. That's okay. Just sit in that emotion and let it go through your system. Imagine your heart is filled, right? If the heart was just filled and you cried a really good cry, it's almost like you take the heart and you dump it out and you empty it out. You will know when you get to the bottom of that, it feels empty. It feels like you did something. It's almost like a release, right? It's a big release. And that's how we have to get it out. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, yeah. Yeah. It, it can be so relaxing in some way to me personally, when I've cried. Uh, so yeah. yeah. So it's, it's hard though, Johnny, because a lot of guys feel like, well, I don't want to cry, you know, because they were taught that. And the th to me and with what I've experienced with a lot of grievers, the fastest way through is releasing it, is allowing those emotions. We were given them for a reason. Why were we given tears? We were given tears for a reason to use it. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely... It's definitely something that's helped me in uh, through, the, through the crying process, whether that's kind of like a song or something. Sometimes it's like an anchor reminds me of something, yeah. but in a, in a kind of good way um, as well. But yeah, no, um, with, your, with your like grieving then, is it, I mean, is it something that like people come to you about, like you said, obviously it can be in all sorts of forms, but people come to you mainly about obviously deaths or do they come to you sometimes about other subjects as well sometimes people come from divorce sometimes okay. people come from death sometimes people hear me or see me or find me and they're like i'm not sure that i'm grieving and i help them find out we connect the dots there most of the time people come because of death because it really haven't gotten out the word that grief is not just for death um, I know there's a lot of grief specialists working in the world now trying to get the word out, mm. but, um, my specialty is definitely anyone who's grieving from a, a recent death. But the thing that we find out is we start with the death and then we start to do a review of their heart. And we find out, I don't know, in seventh grade, I was bullied all year. And this one kid chased me home from school for one year, and I'm still holding on to that pain. And that might be the area I start working at. So a lot of times it's the death that brings them, but we never know where we're going to end up until we actually start doing the work. Mm. Brilliant. I'll still do the work on the death, but we, we look to see what else is in there. Yeah. Helping them with that self-awareness yeah. and uh, yeah. ultimately getting rid of what, you know, helping them feel what they need to feel a little bit more. Yeah. Um, love it, Sharon. So Sharon, uh, really valuable insight into the whole grieving process and what you're doing out there is amazing helping people uh, in the world with this so just before we sort of like wrap up today in um from this conversation one is there any kind of final points you wanted to share and two where can people find out more about your work so the final point i would say is don't be afraid don't be afraid to do your grief work a lot of times it's the fear that keeps us from doing the work and the fear is the, it was a protection mechanism put in there and it's okay. Do if it's not me, if you find someone else, do your work, you will be so much happier because of it. Um, so that was me. That's the one thing I want to leave you with. I'm at Sharon I also have the book, uh, the healing place. It can be found mm -hmm. on Amazon. So I wrote a book that's for the fresh new griever, just answering some questions about what they're going to be going through. So that's amazing. And I have done TEDx where I debunk the five stages of grief, but SharonBrewBaker.com is always the best place to find out all the information that you need about me. Fantastic. We'll be sure to link that up to find out more about your, your work. So a big thank you again, Sharon, for everything uh, today. And it's great being great having you today. It was an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you.
So that concludes our episode for today. And remember, work on your self-confidence every single day.